like that and still somehow find a way, despite our obvious and natural differences of approach, to speak with one clear voice. Because it seems to me that that is, today, the major challenge facing your district and every other district that I know. My colleagues and I counsel school boards and school districts in 37 states. And I want to suggest to you a postulation that will run counter to probably almost everything that you believe way down here. But I really have to share it with you because the external evidence is that this postulation is the answer, or part of the answer at least, to the difficulties facing us. My postulation is this. As educators, we naturally devote ourselves almost entirely to our students. We are children-centered. We do believe every child can learn, and that's where our energy goes. And if we extend that at all, we extend it usually to parents, because we realize that, after all, they have the bigger role in educating youngsters. And so we're focused on these audiences what I like to call the classroom and just a little beyond audience. And my postulation is that those are no longer the number one audience, the number one public for those of us who are educators and want to remain educators. Whether we like it or not, the number one public now is the stockholders of the school system, the voters, the folks out there who ultimately make and shape the decisions that affect what goes on inside that classroom. <clears throat> the currently popular management book, as many of you know, was written by the chairman of GE, Jack Welch. The title of it is, Control Your Own Destiny or Somebody Else Will. My evidence in almost 40 years of working with school districts is that today, unless we find a way somehow to add this other key public to the thinking patterns and the behavior patterns of everyone in the school family, and of course, to speak to that public with one clear voice, that indeed that which we want to concentrate on, that inside the classroom, inside the school building and the school system, is going to be lost to us in terms of really functional control. Now, I don't postulate, as I know you don't, that we who are trained and practicing as educators have all the answers. Education is too important to be left to educators, and I think most of us agree to this. But nonetheless, it is also true, and this is what drives my postulation, it is also true that this other public this community public, these folks who in fact can make the decisions, have no way whatsoever to evaluate what goes on inside the schools. I'll give you an example. All of us use healthcare services. Can you really evaluate what your doctor is doing with you? If you go into the hospital for a procedure, what techniques do you have to evaluate whether or not they did the right thing? Did they choose the right option out of six prescriptions to deal with your condition? The answer is obviously no. And if you look across American life, this has become part of almost every aspect of our lives. That the technology, the detail, has gotten beyond the understanding of the average person. And so we are, as we were told a minute ago, back to this question of trust. Can people trust us? And in the case of schools, it's even worse, because most of us have never worked inside a medical system. And so we're totally outsiders to that. But of course, everyone has been in school. 50 years ago, maybe, but they've been there. And those perceptions that they formed are still driving their thinking. And so, maybe this is why we're always seeking for these quick silver bullet evaluation methods. We'll count this particular set of numbers and boy, we'll know if the school is successful. I think most of us by now know that there aren't any such evaluation methods that are going to be holistic and realistic. But 
nonetheless, this is the drive for that. Because you could be factually the best school district in the universe. And the people in this area wouldn't have any way of actually judging that. And so here we are, away from the whole reason we exist, trying to do good things for a very targeted set of youngsters inside the school and inside the classroom, faced now with the proposition that we have to treat the whole community as a different kind of a classroom, that each of us must get involved, and that we have to speak to this community with one clear voice. Now, I know how you feel. You're just getting ready to go back to the school year. You're getting ready to tackle all those situations that involve getting school going again, getting the youngsters in, delivering the systems, and most importantly, delivering the education. And then you come to a session like this, and some guy from over 50 miles away, so therefore he's an expert, comes in and says, you have to now think about this broader public. Just what you need, one more assignment. And yet, I don't know how, literally, I do not know how to escape discussing this with you and urging you to make this a priority for your year, in fact, probably for the rest of your careers. Because you are not alone. The same thing is happening in every institution in American life. If you're in a business setting today, what are you talking about? You're talking about re-engineering. You're talking about going back to core competencies. You're talking about restructuring the way we do business, the same terms that, that you've been using, changing the way we do business. If you're in healthcare, oh my goodness, I don't even have to talk about it. We all know this. So those of us in the school shouldn't feel put upon. We should simply feel that we're part of this broader mainstream of change. But it is, I submit, a different kind of a change. There's a wonderful cartoon in the New Yorker not long ago that I think, for me anyway, really describes it best. A young man is uh, getting ready to go to bed and he's saying his prayers uh, on his knees alongside his bed. And instead of asking, you know, for a new bicycle or getting to know the new kids that just moved in up the street or those typical things, this is what he says. He says, and please give me good linguistic comprehension, <laughs> cultural perspective, multi-ethnic cognizance, and a high socio-dynamic potential. That, I think, is the change. Now, I have to give you one warning, and that is that I am breaking Virginia law today. I'm sure you all know it's a law here give a presentation like this, you have to bring handouts. Well, I didn't bring any handouts. The reason I did is because I really am not here to give you a formula. I have some formulas I can share with you. But my experience is overwhelming that all issues, all topics, particularly involving the schools, are inherently local. They have a flavor that will be different here and from the next district over, and certainly from the next state over. And so what I want to do is to hopefully stimulate your thinking about the issues so that you can deal with the solutions. And so for that reason, if you want to share some of these ideas later, I'm afraid you're going to have to write them down because there won't be any handouts at the door as we leave. The first thing that I want to talk about is changing some cliches. We really need to go to work changing the cliches that are prevalent about schools if we're going to ever reach this external community. And you know what the cliches are now. Schools are bad. Schools don't teach. Johnny can't read. You know the long litany. You also know that there's kind of a second set of cliches rapidly changing which is the solutions that are proposed to deal with the first set. If there's anyone in this room that understands all of the proposals to 
to improve our schools, I'd like you to raise your hand. If there's anyone here that could even list all of the ideas or the programs, the national programs even, that are going to change our schools, I'd like you to raise your hand, but I don't expect anybody to do it. So you begin to see the problem. We've got a set of cliches floating around there which are essentially negative, and then we've got a whole mixed bag of solutions to this, and I would like to have in the, this district, Chesterfield area, I would like to change that and move to a different set of cliches, or maybe a single cliche. I don't know what the exact words of that cliche must be, but are we smart enough to come up with a quick, solid statement that everyone in the district can use that doesn't turn people off, that isn't bragging about how good we are, but that somehow gets out there that this is what education is like here in this school area. I don't even know if I can start you down the track of what some of the words might be, although I've read some of the work you've done, and you've got some fairly good phrases out there now. Now, I know, as educators, we tend to resist this whole approach. It's kind of the Ronnie Reagan political approach. We'll have a short little slogan, and it will solve the problem. But whether you and I like it or not, most of the folks out there will only give that much time and that much attention to the problem. And I would suggest to you that though Ronnie may have been wrong on a few occasions, little items like the military buildup and the deficit, you know, little things like this, the simple fact is that we Americans sat right there and cheered him on every step of the way. Why did we do it? Because he knew how to put into our heads at least the seed of a line of thinking. And he did it with a set of cliches which nonetheless had powerful, emotional, dramatic words in them that people wanted to hear. He was brilliant at this. In fact, the, the best example I probably could give you, because it's one that we've done a lot of work with, both for and against, I should tell you. It's a nice thing about being a counselor. You get to work on all sides of an issue. Remember Star Wars? Now just think of that, Star Wars. Ronnie sold $42 billion worth of research and development programs to a reluctant Congress with two words, Star Wars. And it was brilliant work, because it wasn't really a Star Wars program at all, technically. It was called the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI. And so, Having launched it as SDI, which of course nobody understood, that would be like some of the phrases we use, which make great sense to us. Joe and Jane Sixpack haven't got the slightest idea what we're talking about right there. Just, just, just think about this for a minute. Ronnie comes before us all, he says, we're going to have this strategic defense initiative. And then someone in his office purposely says, well, yeah, let me explain this to you. It's really kind of a Star Wars. And everybody laughs and makes jokes about this. And then Ronnie comes back and he says, well, he says, I, you kind of hurt my feelings in the Star Wars stuff. He says, it's far more serious than that. I, I really want you to always call it the Strategic Defense Initiative. So henceforth, he always got two bites out of the apple whenever this was mentioned. Because whenever anyone talked about it in the media or in Congress, they always said the Strategic Defense Initiative, popularly known as Star Wars. You see how that kind of thing can work? Are we smart enough, right here at Chesterfield, to come up with some kind of a phrase that can drive out those old negatives, schools don't work, education is failing our kids? Because whether we like it or not, probably at the end of the day, we're going to have to have, if not one, at least a half a dozen of these. Let me give you another example. I'm starting with this because I know a lot of you are resistant as good educators to this simplistic way of putting ideas into people's heads, although I can give you thousands of examples out of your own curriculum, how you've been doing it to us and you students forever and ever and ever. You think about how you teach your subject, that's what you do. Well, we're teaching a subject now, and it's a kind of reluctant group of students out there. So 
we need to use the best techniques we can to really, really get through to these people. And so that's why I, I wanted to start with this, this uh, possibly resisted, but nonetheless important idea. Now, if we can do that, how are we going to get everyone to talk this way? Well, obviously, we're going to have to do a lot of team working to make this happen. I was involved a year ago in a, a boycott of a major store chain in the Midwest. And let me show you, again, just how having a standard answer can really work. Naturally, when you have a boycott and then people are picketing outside the stores, this makes it pretty interesting news. You know, the cameras love that kind of stuff, all the drama, the excitement, people marching up and down with signs. And in this case, it was particularly exciting because it took place in Detroit, the automobile capital, and it was a union situation, and the union that wanted to organize the set of stories was the United Auto Workers. So as you can see, this had a real public interest. I mean, don't ask me the factual questions. And see what I mean? Facts don't matter anymore. I mean, why would the United Auto Workers be wanting to organize the people who work in a department store, I don't know. What's that have to do with anything anymore? But all the picketing is going on, all the cameras are worried. So we got all our store managers together. We said, now look, when the, when the government officials and when the media come, you don't even talk about this. You say, pickets? Well, yeah, I guess they are picketing out there. But business is brisk. See, that's what you want the world to know. Don't stay away from the stores. Keep coming. Never mind those pickets. Business is brisk. So that night, after this boycott was launched, we all watched the TV coverage. 42 store managers, it's, a, it's amazing that the media didn't catch this. 42 store managers were on television saying business is worse. I mean, I could hear the TV audience all over metropolitan Detroit starting to laugh about the fourth time, you see? By the time it got up into the 20s, the manager said business is brisk. You want to go to the next manager, business is brisk. You see what that did to the boycott? The boycott was now a joke. It was a laugh. In fact, failed miserably. Well, it really didn't. It was wonderful. It called so much attention to the stores that business went up 53%. That's <laughs> the fact is, we had one clear voice, a simple statement, because by saying business is brisk, what we said was, you don't need to stay away from the stores because these people are picketing out there. What's that got to do with anything? It's getting close to Christmas Eve. You better come and get your shopping done. The business is brisk. means a lot of people are in the stores. The clerks are all here. Hey, come on down. Now, can we do that? That's the first, the first question that I, that I leave you with. And how do we get it done? How do we get it done? Well, I know you, you're going to want some educators always want everything to be proven. So let me see if I can prove something to you. First, though, I'm going to give you a little demonstration of what Joe and Jane are up against when they try to evaluate the schools. You know, I've given over 2,000 presentations, and every time I come to one of these things, I still have to figure out by doing this, uh, that ain't going to do it, Anybody got a black? Wait a minute. There's the roll. I don't have one. <laughs> I mean, this is where Joe and Jane are trying to figure out the school. That's the point I'm trying to get across here. <laughs> See, they need a technician to tell them what's going on. And that's what one clear voice is going to do for us. Thank you very much. 
administrative decision making. Maybe we need coaches and champions and people like that instead of managers, but it kind of trips off my tongue because of all the business people I have to work with, so don't be offended by it. You who are the coaches, the champions, the managers, really are the first step in the process of achieving one clear voice. And the reason you are is because one clear voice begins inside your group and with the policy makers. You can't speak with one clear voice unless you can agree what that voice ought to be. Surely you're going to want to have input from everyone in the family who wants to give you some input. You're going to want to make sure that the one clear voice approach you're taking is going to be acceptable to others. But the fact is, it's got to begin with you. And the keys to beginning with you, there are two keys. The first is showing respect for all the other people in this system. And the second is the ability to manage conflict. Notice I did not say conflict resolution. There's one thing we've learned in dynamic quality organizations is that we do not want to resolve conflicts. We want to encourage constructive conflicts. Because the psychologists tell us time and time again that all all new ideas. Thank you. I think this is great. We'll see how it works. <laughs> All creativity comes from the sparking caused by the clash of two ideas, which are not in sync. So we do not want to resolve conflicts, but we want to manage them. And so the question for you is, are you comfortable that you have in place or can put in place a method of being able to respect the many differing opinions among yourselves and to manage the conflicting ideas in a constructive way because if you can't do that, one clear voice simply won't happen. Those of you who are board members will not be surprised to know that I do a number of uh, assignments every year. I and my colleagues with school boards and with the school boards associations in the state and nationally on how do you get five or seven people who were elected to the position, probably representing a viewpoint in the community, to go through this same exercise. How do you get them to be able to be true to their constituency and to their beliefs and still speak with one clear voice? It's eminently possible. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that particular problem. All I can say is that it is possible. We've proven it again and again. But the key is, we have to find a way to make absolutely certain that the respect among ourselves is there and that you as managers have to manage conflicts not only in this group, but also with those who work in your particular aspect of the system. If we can begin there with solid, one clear voice thinking, we then can move one clear voice out across the school family. The key here is, of course, having coordinated messages and information flow across the school family. And again, respect and conflict management are key, but even more critical is a method that's so old, all of us know the phrase by heart. It was first really postulated by the behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner way back in the late 50s. And yet we now realize that change in organizations begins with positive reinforcement. If managers are not continually giving constructive positive reinforcement to the folks that work with them, do not expect change. Because the opposite of positive reinforcement, criticism, doubts, leave people lacking self-confidence. People who lack self-confidence who aren't sure they're doing the job right, will resist change to the last ounce of energy. But people who are positively reinforced, even if, in terms of constructive criticism, are ready for change. So notice what we're talking about. We're talking about a principle that begins with you as managers and your ability to manage conflict among yourselves and with those you work with. We're talking then about enlarging the principle to the whole school family and to using positive reinforcement to say to everybody, we can do it, you can do it. And then we move to the external publics. And now, what's the key? The key is that the school family add this other dimension to their responsibilities and become
become the messengers to the community. Now, I want to really emphasize this point so there can be no understanding. And now we'll see if our, our gray marker works. And it's really black. The color is just gray. Maybe that's a little like the schools, too. It's really different inside there, but people see the outside and think it is different. We've been studying organizations in this country, in fact, in the world, for exactly 93 years. The first organizational behavior managerial studies were done in the year 1900. And so if you take all of those studies and take the high points from them, it's possible to draw a model of what makes an organization effective. And I want to share quickly this four-step model with you because I think it will demonstrate why one clear voice is critical and also partly how you achieve it. This model begins with a sense of mission. Or, I guess as we would say in recent years, it begins with a mission statement. Anybody here that has written at least six mission statements in the last three, four years, please raise your hand. Yeah, I know. It's a bore, but of course we don't call them mission statements anymore, do we? Now they're vision statements. Well, whatever they are, maybe some of those, now if you have the six-page version, no, but if you have the one-sentence version, maybe some of those become this new cliche, this new phrase that we're going to get out. The fact is an organization that doesn't know its mission is not going to speak with one clear voice. It is simply impossible. It was mentioned that we work with the nuclear power. Actually, we, even more importantly, one of our challenges is that we counsel the Department of Energy and the National Nuclear Laboratories. It's a relatively simple problem. We merely need to get the American public to love plutonium. <laughs> not sure we're getting there, but one of the things I've been doing the last several years is trying to get 15,000 PhD physicists to speak with one clear voice on this subject. Now, uh, they're actually getting quite close. So if they can do it, I'm sure you can do it, because here's what we've discovered. We've discovered that once you can agree on what your mission or your vision